So, uh, so fantastic, and I'm sure that there are no seats left because you're all eager to hear about Sean's new book, uh, which is historical but also timely and relevant for today. Uh, and he's going to talk about the book. Certainly, in the election today, economic inequality has been a major theme that has come up, uh, and how we address it as a country. And in his new book, Professor Wilentz unravels the commanding role that party politics has played in our struggle against economic inequality. The, like, now, now you hold it up. I'm oh, it's OK. Here you, you go. This is, there's many more outside, actually. And I'm say conveniently that. for, oh, okay, I'll I shut up. The politicians and the egalitarians, the hidden history of American politics, opens with two key statements. America is built on an egalitarian tradition, and partisanship is a permanent fixture, fixture, one that betters our country, which is maybe a useful thing to hear in the contemporary climate. Guided by these insights, Professor Wilentz provides a bold new portrait of American political history with perspectives from politicians and egalitarians, including Thomas Paine, Abraham Lincoln, and W.E.B. Du Bois. Previously, Wilentz's acclaimed book, The Rise of American Democracy, won the Bancroft Prize and was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. He is the George Henry Davis 1886 Professor of American History and Professor of History at Princeton University. Professor Wilentz is going to share some thoughts about his book, and then afterwards, you can purchase one to keep outside. So please join me in welcoming Sean Willett. Thank you, Meg. Can you all hear me well? Yeah? OK. I, I, I'm sorry I'm going to make you tilt, but I'm very old school. I need these things to hold up my notes. Um, thank you so much for coming today. Thank you, Meg, for that lovely introduction. It's great to be back at the Woodrow Wilson School, which is just across the street from where I work anyway. So I haven't traveled that far. But it's great to see so many friends, so many people from town, actually. It's great. Um, these occasions truly are about bringing us all together um, across, across the gates. I'm going to talk today, as, as Meg said, about this book that I published back in May, uh, The Politician. I'll hold it up again. The Politicians and the Egalitarians, The Hidden History of American Politics. It's a bunch of essays, actually, that I've written over the years, but um, collected because I realized that, in fact, they actually did have a theme. The, 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 my, my writing has not been quite as scattered or helter-skelter as all of that, that there had been a hidden theme in them, and I brought them out and revised some of those essays to accentuate those themes. The basic theme is, is in the title, and the most important part of the title is the ampersand that connects the two words. It's about the politicians and the egalitarians, two groups that are often thought to be in more or less continuous or continual bitter opposition, but who, in fact, I like to see, I want to argue, are, in fact, harmonious, when harmonious, can get a great deal done. The politicians and the egalitarians, who are they? Well, they are two distinct but overlapping groups whom, I, as I argue, become, have served as the driving forces of American political history. For most of our history, including today above all, Americans are prone to seeing politicians as corrupt, as dirty. The word dirty always hovers above the word politics when Americans consider politics because politicians are the instruments of corruption, self-interest, what have you. Whereas egalitarians, oh, they're great because they are the driving force of being pure. They are purer than, than politicians are. They are the people who speak truth to power. And it is a generally accepted view of American politics, I think. I, I'm, I'm curious to see if you agree with this, that things happen in American history. Change happens in American history when these egalitarians <coughs> push the politicians to the point where stasis is no longer possible and change emerges from the bottom up. Does that sound familiar? Okay. Um, there's some truth to that. 
But that truth misses some larger truths. And in particular, it misses a, very, a much larger moral truth, because this book is about morality as much as it's about politics. And that morality is actually captured in the, in, in the, in the uh, words that I chose as the book's epigraph. And they're from the theologian Reinhold Niebuhr, written actually earlier in his career in 1929. And I'm going to read it to you because I think it sums up, as, as well as anything, what the point of my book actually is. Niebuhr wrote, quote, it may be well for the statesman to know that statesmanship easily degenerates into opportunism and that opportunism cannot be sharply distinguished from dishonesty. But the prophet ought to realize that his higher perspective and the uncompromising nature of his judgments always has a note of irresponsibility in it. Francis of Assisi may have been a better Christian than Pope Innocent III, but it may be questioned whether his moral superiority over the latter was as absolute as it seemed. Nor is there any reason to believe that Abraham Lincoln, the statesman and opportunist, was morally inferior to William Lloyd Garrison, the prophet. The moral achievement of the statesman must be judged in terms which take account of the limitations of human society, which the statesman must and the prophet need not consider. We're dealing really at two different moral planes. The moralist, the prophet, who wants to bring truth to the world, and the politician or the statesman who has to deal with a world that is inherently immoral. How do you translate truth? Excuse me, I'm going to turn this off. It shouldn't be on. Pardon me. That's truth speaking to power, <laughs> or power speaking to truth, or something. Anyway, that's done. How does, how does change happen in that? It's very difficult for a prophet simply to get his or her way in an immoral world. It's difficult for a, uh, a politician to work in an immoral world without becoming immoral himself. But we have to understand politics as existing in these two different realms. And we have to see the politicians and the egalitarians operating not so much in opposition to each other, although they often do, but as groups that can converge and that when they converge, great things can happen. And that's the moral background to the book I've written. Again, two distinct realms, not so much pushing against each other, although that will certainly happen, as with the possibilities of convergence. Now, with that background, the book argues that there are really two keys to understanding American political history, for all of its history. One key is the inevitability of parties, political parties, in American history. This is something, again, that we don't like to talk about too much because we tend to think of political parties as hindrances to democracy rather than as vehicles for democracy. Certainly, the, fa the framers of the Constitution, the founding fathers, if you will, did not trust party politics, did not trust partisanship. They thought that it was going to be a vehicle for ambition, for the worst kinds of um, um, dissolution of the commonwealth, of the common good, they thought parties were a bad thing. And yet, very quickly in our history, it took about three years, after the framing of the Constitution and the beginning of the first Congress in 1789, parties began to arise. The conflicts among Americans, the conflicts of interest among Americans were just too great to be handled by gentlemen assembled together to try and, with great liberality and light, find the common good. Those conflicts were there, and they had to be fought out. But they had to be fought out in a way that was consistent with the Constitution, and that would advance Americans' ideals, but in a way that would ultimately respect each other. There had to be a basic comity, or else there could be no American peace, no American nation. These parties arose. They arose first as Federalists and Republicans. They transformed over time, they had various different you know, labels to them. There were many, many other parties, the cavalcade of parties in the 19th century in particular, with names like hard, cell, hard shells and soft shells, and I won't bore you with all of that. But parties, and in particular two parties, have always been essential to American politics, and I argue always will be. Just as a parenthetical note, I would add that what we are seeing today is not party politics. What we are seeing today 
is the uh, attempted destruction of party politics. What we're seeing today is an abnormal political situation. I would even argue an abscessed situation. So don't think that what we're living through today has anything to do with what I'm talking about. Because what we're seeing today is something of a rupture, one that I think will end, one that I think will return to normality at some point, hopefully sooner rather than later. But do not confuse the two. I'm talking about normal party politics. I'm talking about party politics of organized coalitions that are coalitions. They are not united in, around anything other than their certain common ideas, in the case of the Republicans and the Democrats, quite obviously, that they have been a major force in American politics. And that, indeed, there has been an anti-party position throughout that has achieved absolutely nothing in our history. Perhaps at the local level, yes. There have been anti-party politics that have emerged throughout American history. You can see it, well, you can see it as recently as, as uh, pr President Obama's early statements of post-partisanship trying to get beyond party politics, which didn't exactly work out. Um, all the way back into the 19th century, the Confederacy was maybe the biggest experiment in anti-party politics in American history. None of those experiments have ever worked out. Partisanship is not only inevitable in American history, I would argue it is a positive thing in American history. The second key is inequality. That from the virtu virtually the very beginning of the nation, Americans have been concerned with the extent to the ex uh, about the extent to which vast inequalities, material inequalities, and imp implied in that are also inequalities, social inequalities, particularly of race. Too great a disparity, too great an inequality will necessarily endanger democracy. That if there is a privileged class that is so far and beyond the rest of the population, and a poor class that is so far below, that necessarily presents in itself a danger to republicanism and then eventually to democracy. And that a great deal of American politics has been mobilized around that desire to keep those inequalities from growing too vast. It's not about absolute equality. That is always a non-starter in America. You know, America is an entrepreneurial country. There's going to be, you know, people who are going to be richer than others. There are going to be people who are more talented than others. But when that has been allowed to become too great, democracy is in danger. And it's usually the case that that is happening, Americans assume, because the, something's, wrong with the something's wrong with the politics. Something's wrong with the government. Something has to be done to change that and can be done to change that. Those are the basic themes of the book that there are parties on the one hand and there is this egalitarian tradition really continuing struggle on the other. The magic of American history, American pol political history, I think, is when you see the convergence of the politicians and the egalitarians of party politics and those who are trying to keep inequality from going too great from actually converging. And they do converge. They've converged. They converged around 1800 in the election of Thomas Jefferson. They, they certainly converged at the time of the Civil War. They converged in the 1930s. They converged in the 1960s. They converged in different ways, at different times. That's what keeps historians like Megan and I in business. You know, it's never quite the same all the time. But nevertheless, you can see certain patterns. And those patterns involve very much the convergence of these two groups. That is not to say, and let me say this also parenthetically, that is not to say that um, you know, the egalitarians don't contain any politicians within them, and that the politicians don't contain any egalitarians within them. Okay? It's not as if they're two you know, dist completely different, distinct groups. Not true. You know, if you go to, I don't know, if you go to the, uh, well, what's most familiar, the, 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 the rise of the civil rights movement and the great society. There was no better politician, no savvier politician, in my view, in America in the 1960s than Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. He knew how to build a crisis, to expand on a crisis, and then how to use his friends inside the federal government to get things done, and how to build those alliances. He was extremely savvy. By the same token, throughout the Johnson administration and the Kennedy administration, there were plenty of people who were perfect egalitarians. I mean, if you just look at the, um, uh, Robert Kennedy's Justice Department, inside Robert Kennedy's Justice Department, people like John Doerr from Princeton, people like Nick Katzenbach from Princeton, people like, I can go on and on and on, Burke Marshall from Yale, but nevertheless, important <laughs> men. These were men who were true egalitarians, and they weren't just men either. Um, so it's not as if these two groups don't, can't find common ground pretty quickly if they are given the opportunity to do so. Uh, 
The problem, of course, is that, that those opportunities don't always present themselves. There are plenty of cases when each side viewing each other warily, there's a lack of leadership. But when the leadership from one side and the leadership from the other side actually converge, amazing things can happen. It's a very simple argument. It's not a particularly abstruse argument, but it's one that I think can explain American history better than arguments that are much more abstruse. So that's the beginning of the book. I outline it that way. Those are the basic categories. I then run through, as Meg said, I go through the course of American political history, beginning with Thomas Jefferson, uh, sorry, beginning with Thomas Paine, who I argue is really the originator of the American egalitarian tradition, a man who was very much involved in politics at both the state level in Pennsylvania and later at the national level as an advisor to Thomas Jefferson. It then goes to Jefferson and goes through a series of figures including such disparate characters as John Brown, who is a, uh, you know, the, 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 the terrorist of the group, and goes all the way to Lyndon Johnson with certain carries overs to the present as well. But they are about particular figures. I don't try to carry, you know, cover the entire sweep of American political history. I couldn't have done it in a book this length. That wasn't my point. But the point was to try and show certain moments through certain people in order to uh, illuminate my arguments. Okay. So what I thought I'd do today was to give you two of these people one of whom is an incredibly bad odor these days, especially among professors like myself, I think out in the, in the, generally in the American population as well, Thomas Jefferson, and the other who is the Amer great American saint of American politics. Well, one of the two. One is FDR, the other is Abraham Lincoln. I'm going to talk about Lincoln. And I hope at the end of this, you will see that Thomas Jefferson is somewhat different than what you may have thought he was, and that Abraham Lincoln was a great deal different than what you thought he was, all right? Along the lines that I'm arguing about politicians and egalitarians, all right? I'm going to present some remarks here, but I'm also going to read from the book with your indulgence, because what I wrote is far better than anything I could say <laughs> um, about all this, because I, I, I took the time, actually, to, to, to write it carefully. So I'm going to do some reading, and it'll also give you a, you know, a taste of the book itself, right? So that you know, when you buy it, maybe, I hope, it'll be a little, what, a little appetizer to help you encourage to take the whole meal. All right. Starting with Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson, as you may know, those of you, any of, a, any of us with gray hair, which is a number of us in the audience, um, has, his reputation has taken a great tumble. In the 1940s, the 1950s, even into the 1960s, um, Jefferson was thought, as he's thought by many millions today, as a noble figure as the author of the Declaration of Independence, and with that, the author of America's, the founding of America's egalitarian creed. We hold these truths to be so evident that all men are created equal. That was the beginnings <coughs> of American democracy. Well, his reputation has come under a sustained attack over the last 40, 50 years for understandable reasons. When the civil rights movement cracked open American politics, it cracked open American history as well. And with the cracking open of, of, of American apartheid, therefore American history was going to be reconsidered, and reconsidered with slavery at the center of American history in a way that was not the case when m many of us were still in school. Okay. Slavery was fundamental. Even when po American politics were not about slavery, they were about slavery. When you reconfigure American politics that way, it's impossible to consider Thomas Jefferson as quite the heroic marble character that we thought he'd been for all those years. He's simply the founder of the egalitarian creed. Although he criticized slavery, Jefferson did through the 1780s, he backed off from those criticisms. He became quite uh, furtive on the issue of slavery. He never freed more than a handful of his own slaves, and, th and those that he did were the family of his concubine slave, Sally Hemings. How can you respect a man who owned hundreds of slaves during his lifetime, bought and sold human beings, who wrote notes to the state of Virginia, not only in anti-slavery um, passages, some powerful anti-slavery passages, but some of those hair-raising racist commentary to ever be penned by an American in the 18th century? How can we respect this man anymore? He looks entirely different. Worse, he seems to, in his um, a championing of small government, you know, um, and his attacks on Hamiltonian um, energetic government. He seems, at least some have argued, 
to prefigure the kind of small government arguments that later were be, to be advanced in favor of slavery by the likes of John C. Calhoun and Jefferson Davis, and then were going to be used against the federal government by the likes of George C. Wallace. That's Jeffersonianism, small government. We don't like the government getting involved in our affairs. Jefferson's also been faulted as a politician, you know, a man who preached living in government and yet at the same time went about doing things like approving the Louisiana Purchase, a pretty large exercise of federal government power right there. He's thought of as a hypocrite, a man who had, had stated principles but never really stood by them. Okay. Well, on slavery I want to argue and I do argue here, that Jefferson's actual career was nothing like the caricature that's been drawn of him for understandable reasons. Because we have to realize that before the 1770s, not just in the United States, but in the world, in the Western world, there was very little in the way of resistance to slavery, very little anti-slavery sentiment anywhere. For millennia, for millennia, slavery had been thought of not just as something that was to be approved, it was thought to be a natural condition of mankind. If you go back to Aristotle, all the way back there, it's very clear that some people are born to be slaves and some are born to be masters. And that was a view that was not only widespread, it was, it was almost uniform in Western civilization, much of Western culture, right up to the middle of the 18th century. There was some, you know, um, bickering about this. The Quakers, for example, in America, they were arguing against slavery as early as the 1680s, but they did very little about it. They were very cautious about doing this. Suddenly, in the middle of the 18th century, particularly around the year 1716, 1770, the outbreak of the American Revolution, there was a moral revolution of no small dimension on the issue of slavery. Something extraordinary happened. It doesn't happen that often in world history, but it happened in the Western world, as I say, in the 1760s and 1770s, the beginning of something that was extraordinary, which is that an institution of oppression that had been thought to be natural all of a sudden was deemed unnatural, not just by the people who suffered under it. The slaves never thought that slavery was a good thing, was a natural thing, but among those who were benefiting from it. An extraordinary moral revolution. You can see it. Um, in all kinds of statements, you can see it uh, pulling out in, in the United States, for example, in the uh, passage of the very first emancipation laws in all of world history, beginning in Pennsylvania in 1780. You see agitation against slavery, unlike anything you'd seen before, and you see it in Jefferson as well. Jefferson is at the leading edge of that moral revolution. In 1774, in his summary view of British America, in his 1776 draft of the Declaration of Independence, which have, if it hadn't been cut out by the Southerners at the, at the, uh, you know, at, in Philadelphia, would have included a very strong attack on the African slave trade, unlike anything that any American had produced in an official document to that point. In 1784, he pressed for the um, elimination, or rather the, um, um, the, the abolition of slavery and the prevention of slavery from spreading into any of the American territories north or south. That was Jefferson's committee that got that done. It was going to end up as the Northwest Ordinance. Lost by a single vote. Had that happened, American, the course of American history would have been very, very different. Very, very different. That was Jefferson as well. Now, there's no doubt that he became much more circumspect about slavery thereafter. Notes of the state of Virginia, which he wrote in 1785, where he has these hair-raising racist statements, at the same time has anti-slavery statements that John Adams in Massachusetts say were, quote, worth diamonds. That was not supposed to be published and pub you know, uh, issued in pub public circulation, the notes. It was a private document that got sent out to the public, and Jefferson got scared because he envisaged in the notes of the state of Virginia what he called total emancipation. This did not go down well in Virginia. This did not go down well with his fellow slaveholders. And from then on in, Jefferson realized, this slavery, I'm going to stay away from it, and he very much did. There's no doubt that his views on race were illiberal, even by 18th century standards. Although here again, he does talk about the universality of the moral sense, which many um, um, uh, theorists of race did not believe in, Africans as well as, as Europeans. And as slavery grew, he was, you know, left with his old views. He always thought of anti-slavery in the you know, beginning of the 19th century as some sort of federalist or neo-federalist plot. Yet his legacy, 
was hardly that of John C. Calhoun and Jefferson Davis. This is a calumny about, about him. Indeed, in the 1850s, when the slavery issue was coming to the fore, around the Kansas-Nebraska Act, for example, those who were pro-slavery denounced the Declaration of Independence and with it Thomas Jefferson to say that the Declaration of Independence was a self-evident lie, as one senator put it in 1854, or a series of glittering generalities that made no, no, made no sense. The Confederacy, as Alexander Stevens in, 18, in, in 1861 said, the Confederacy was based on an explicit rejection of the idea that all men were created equal. It was based on the, on the, on the absolute um, um, principle that uh, whites were meant to govern blacks completely. Likewise, on the questions of his inconsistency, as on the Louisiana Purchase, we can talk about this. Jefferson never preached purity. As president, um, after the fierce election of 1800, he provided a model of leadership that was protean, that was compromising, that often did not live up to what his stated principles were. But sometimes it's important to have a public position and a private position. And he pursued that public politics extremely well, <laughs> including the enforcement of the embargo. All of these criticisms, I think, and there, some, of them, some of them are important, and Jefferson has to be seen, you know, whole. But I think they miss the point of Jefferson's place in the egalitarian and the partisan traditions. And I want to say something about what I think the, um, the importance of Jefferson actually is in, after all of this. The first is that he, more than any other American of his time, posited individual sovereignty as the basis for, um, for democracy, for liberty. He saw the pursuit of happiness as every individual's right, that every individual could judge his or her happiness, that all persons were moved by a moral sense to pursue that happiness, and that they required the political equality necessary to move that forward. He did not preach for liberty against equality or equality against liberty. He saw them, the two as entwined. Second, he made it very clear that he believed that conflict was inevitable in a society that was launched, as he put it, on the boisterous sea of liberty. It was Jefferson, after all, with his friend Madison, who invented the first political party, who understood that consensus, in the name of consensus, was necessarily going to um, uh, benefit those who already had power, that conflict was necessary in any kind of democratic order in order to make sure that those who did not have power would go about getting it, had the, e the equal access to politics that was required for them to pursue their happiness. At first, he thought that political party would be temporary, he thought that another party would come up that would respect these differences, but soon enough he understood that the distinctions between Republicans and Federalists, he later called them between um, um, uh, Whigs and Tories, were inevitable. In all of this, Jefferson was very closely connected with egalitarians who most Americans thought of as beyond the pale, particularly Thomas Paine. It was Jefferson in, Tom, in, in 1792 who encouraged Paine, who read, the, read Common Sense and then read The Rights of Man, who wanted to hire him, actually, to uh, run the uh, government, uh, uh, an opposition newspaper in 1790. Paine proceeded to become ever more controversial. He became known as an infidel because of his views on religion. But it was Jefferson who stood up for him and brought him home from exile in France. So Jefferson is open to the egalitarians in a way beyond any other statesman, American statesman of his time, other than Benjamin Franklin. I want to read, though, finally why I think Jefferson is so important. His abiding importance is in his contribution to democracy itself. Recent historians who have refused to grapple with the democracy in the Jeffersonian Republican impulse, or who have rendered it clumsily and anachronistically as a populist cloak for white supremacy and slavery, have entirely missed what made Jefferson important in his own time and makes him important in ours. When Federalist polemicists and intriguers denounced Jefferson as a slaveholding hypocrite, it was not a battle cry for emancipation. It could hardly have been, it, could, it hardly could have been, given that so many of slavery's most extreme defenders were in their own partisan ranks. What Federalists across sectional lines did agree upon was that Jefferson and his supporters' attacks on aristocracy, intolerance, and deference 
threatened to undo the natural order of things and to topple what the Massachusetts federal Fisher Ames called government by, quote, the wise, the good, and the rich. The very word democracy gave Federalists the shivers. Their aim, said one newspaper, was, quote, to present democracy in its native deformity. This is what made Jefferson so dangerous, and this is what drove the Federalists to distraction at the mere thought of a Jeffersonian America, envisaging guillotines at every crossroads, or as the Connecticut Federalist Theodore Dwight predicted, quote, moral, moral catastrophe, quote, the ties of marriage destroyed, our wives and our daughters thrown into the stews, those that means the bordellos, a world full of ignorance, impurity, and guilt, without worship, without a prayer, without a God. Jefferson and his party were steeped in Enlightenment liberalism, and this too frightened the Federalists, who took Jefferson's devotion to science and his insistence on the complete separation of church and state as further proof of his depravity. Jefferson, in this, appealed to men like Paine, the city Democrats, and that connection was no ruse. A slaveholder in slaveholding Virginia, Jefferson, unlike the illiberal slaveholders who despised him, despised him and his vulgar infidel supporters, was attuned to the, the Democrats' egalitarian impulses, and he helped change forever the sum and substance of American life at many levels. In terms of politics, the Federalists believed that as soon as, an, as soon as election days were over, the voting citizenry's participation was over, and that they should therefore defer to their chosen representatives. Jefferson and his supporters, on the other hand, built a prototype of a modern political party with clubs and newspapers and political discussion and criticism year-round. Jefferson pushed at the state level, especially in the North, for widened access to the vote, including the reform or elimination of property qualifications. As a result of Jefferson and his supporters' party-building efforts, which the Federalists in time imitated, the opening years of the 19th century brought some of the most intense campaigning and political participation in all of American history. So to sum up my case for Jefferson, the egalitarian politician, 10 days before he died, in the last letter he ever wrote, Jefferson contended that, quote, the general spread of the light of science had, quote, laid open to every view the palpable truth that the mass of mankind had not been born with saddles on their backs, nor a favored few booted and spurred, ready to ride them legitimately by the grace of God. Now, there are some real contradictions here. By his actions and his inactions, and with his words on race in particular, Jefferson created the paradox that stains his memory. Living off human bondage and its unmetaphorical whips and chains, the legitimacy of which he denied and which mocked his declaration. And yet, over the centuries, more and more Americans have also ridden the ride which Jefferson dreamed, more than Jefferson ever thought possible, by the grace of God, or, if you will, also by the grace of Thomas Jefferson. Do we have time for, Al for, for Abraham Lincoln, too? Yes? All right, let's move on to, to Abe. Now, if Jefferson is in bad odor these days, Abraham Lincoln couldn't be higher. It's Olympian, you know. There is no greater American than, than, than Abraham Lincoln. Um, and there are many ways in which he, he gets that reputation. Some think that he's a man who began as a political hack in Illinois, but who rose to become the greatest American president of all, that's one view of him. But there is, an, is another view of him which is quite negative. And that is to present him as something of a fake. It's kind of undoing the Olympian reputation to say that mm, you know, Abraham Lincoln never rose above becoming a hack politician. He was a reluctant emancipator at best. He was a man who stood for the Union rather than to stand for a war against slavery who had to be pushed by slaves and radicals like Frederick Douglass, who were the real heroes of the story. This sound familiar, these two images of, 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 of Lincoln? OK. Well, neither of those is right. They're both wrong. We begin with the proposition that I want to give to you, which is that Lincoln was always a politician. Let's take the word hack and put it to one side. He was a politician. If they had had passports in these, those days and they'd listed occupation, he would have written 
politician. <laughs> At one point, in fact, there was a debate in the Illinois State, Senate, State Assembly where he was sitting. And he got up and gave a speech. He said, you know, the problem with this bill is being run by mere politicians, politicians who will do everything to advance themselves at the expense of the people generally. And he paused and said, and because I am a politician, I can say that. <laughs> he knew who he was. Everyone knew who he was. He was a man who understood party politics. Having come of age, in fact, in a generation that, 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 where, where party politics had already been there, have had to use the, manipula use the levers of power in particular ways, he was a shrewd and calculating creature of pol politics. He remained so throughout his career to the day he died, to the day he was murdered. He achieved his greatness because of and not despite his political skills. The idea that Abraham Lincoln was someone who experienced some sort of individual awakening, who somehow transcended politics when the slavery issue heated up in the 1850s, transcended politics for a realm more pure, that is a pure fantasy. <clears throat> politics explains how he acted towards ending slavery. He was political to the core. He came out of a part of the anti-slavery movement which often doesn't get enough credit. We think of the anti-slavery movement as the radicals, William Lloyd Garrison, wonderful people, admirable people, but people who did not do anything <laughs> other than to agitate. Now, their agitation was extremely important. When William Lloyd Garrison founded the Liberator magazine in 1831 in Boston and said, I shall be heard on the issue of slavery, well, that was like a lightning crack across the sky of American politics deeply upset the South, alarmed the North, and put slavery on the, on, the, on the agenda as it had not been for a long, long time. But no law was going to pass because of William Lloyd Garrison. No political effort was going to do that. And indeed, Garrison's frustration, his inability to get anything done, led him to reject the Constitution of the United States. The state of the Constitution was basically a pro-slavery document. It was a covenant in hell made with the devil um, and a covenant with death. <laughs> This was not a way to persuade Americans to pass new laws against slavery. <laughs> Lincoln took a different view. Lincoln believed that slavery could be eliminated, and sh you know, not only should it be eliminated, but it could be eliminated under the Constitution, that the Constitution was not a pro-slavery document, or rather it was not entirely a pro-slavery document, that it had anti-slavery elements, and that you could use the Constitution to restrict slavery's expansion, and thereby put slavery, as he put it, in the course of ultimate extinction. It was the constitutional, the political attack on slavery. That's why they were called anti-slavery politicians. And, and Lincoln very early on, actually, starts hanging around with these guys. When he's, he's one undistinguished, supposedly, term in Congress, he's hanging around with these anti-slavery politicians who take a very different view to how, of how you're going to go about ending slavery. He saw this way under the Constitution of slave to, to, to halt slavery's expansion. And importantly, he won the presidency on that platform. The Republican Party, when it is founded in 1854, after the collapse of the Whigs, it is founded as an expressly anti-slavery party. It is not a pro-union party. It is an anti-slavery party. It is dedicated to one thing and one thing only. Well, it's dedicated to a number of things. But the primary thing is to halt slavery's expansion and to begin slavery's doom. That's what the Republican Party platform called for in 1854, in 1856, and in 1860. Abraham Lincoln won the presidency on that platform. That's why the South seceded. The South couldn't imagine an American government run by a president who was dedicated to eliminate slavery, and with a Congress that was you know, fairly evenly split, that nevertheless had a strong um, representation of his party. They could not imagine. They could not imagine being in the same government with these people. So they seceded, beginning with the South Carolinians. South Carolinians are always the hotheads. Anybody from South Carolina here? I don't mean to offend anybody. <laughs> There's a great uh, South Carolina unionist named James Pettigrew who once said of South Carolina, loathe the state of South Carolina. Too small to be a republic in itself, but too large to be an insane asylum. <laughs> <laughs> that was South Carolina. They went out first, but everybody, you know, enough of them followed after fighting for Sumter, et cetera. But it was anti-slavery, Lincoln's anti-slavery, that caused the war. No other reason. So to say that the war began for Union, well, yes, of course. The South had just committed treason. 
And so you wanted to stop the treason and keep the union together. And there are also a lot of northerners who are not so hot about emancipation, frankly. A lot of Democrats out there who didn't like emancipation. But he's trying to hold the nation together. He's trying to end slavery. He's trying to, he has a very complicated situation on his hands. So he is a politician. And he works as a politician. And he guides the nation, you know, the North, and the, 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 the only government that was legitimate, through this crisis, he still had an idea of abolishing slavery state by state. Um, but by late 1862, he knew it was not happening. He was trying to figure out some way to push forward. And by 1862, by September 1862, he understands that the only way to secure the Union would be to begin emancipation, to declare emancipation as a military necessity. Now, he doesn't come to that position, I would argue, because he's being pushed by the radicals. He comes to that position because he reaches the political point. The radicals are you know, certainly out there pushing, and that's fine. But he comes to the judgment that politically, this is what he has to do to win the war. And by winning the war, he will be advancing the cause against slavery. Because if the North wins the war, and the South is defeated, then slavery will be even further along the road to ultimate extinction. That's as of 1862. Now, it is said that it was the egalitarian Frederick Douglass who did all the pushing, you know, among, among others. But, but, but Douglass was important. Douglass was not a Garrisonian at this point. He actually got, got involved in politics. But he was always saying that Lincoln was moving too slowly, you know, that this war should be about slavery. Why isn't it about slavery? He's pushing and complaining and complaining. And the argument is often made that, um, Abraham Lincoln you know, eventually um, you know, wised up to uh, Frederick Douglass, and Frederick Douglass convinced him of what happened. Well, I want to argue something differently. I want to argue that if anybody did the convincing of anybody, it was Lincoln convincing Douglass, but in a very interesting way, in a way in which Lincoln understood what Douglass was talking about, and Douglass had influence, great influence. But it was not quite as simple as the opposition between the politician and the egalitarian, but the convergence of the politician and the egalitarian. So with your permission, I will read my little section on Lincoln and Douglas and see what you think about it. Okay? Lincoln and Douglas became friends. But they only met three times in their lives. They met first in August 1863. And this is after the Emancipation Proclamation has been issued some months afterwards, when Douglas came to the White House to register various complaints, not about the speed of emancipation so much, because it had been declared, but about various issues primarily concerning the mistreatment of black soldiers. Under the Emancipation Proclamation, if you recall, black soldiers were being conscripted into the Union Army, or not conscripted, were being admitted into the Union Army, right? That, that road had been crossed as well. But they were making less money, they, were, they weren't being able to fight in the ways that white soldiers were being allowed to, and Douglas was going to be ticked off by all of this. And he also didn't like many other things about the process, the procedures whereby emancipation was proceeding. So Douglas goes to the White House at the president's invitation. Man was complaining. Abraham Lincoln invites Frederick Douglass to the White House to talk about it. I want to hear what you have to say. Now, this is 1863. Imagine any other white president inviting any black man to the White House to just talk about anything other than a servant or a slave. That in itself was rather extraordinary, and he made a big fuss over Douglas when he arrived, which by the racial implications meant a great deal to Douglas. Douglas said so later on. Oh, the president really took me seriously, which he did, although he was also being very political. And by otherwise handling the situation like a master politician, instead of expressing anger at Douglas, or affecting condescension over Douglas's attacks on him, Lincoln calmly listened to his concerns about the administration's tardiness, explained his own position about the need sometimes to go slowly, and forthrightly insisted that he had never vacillated on emancipation or on any other important decision. Lincoln also endorsed with his own signature an official pass through Union lines that was issued to Douglas earlier in the day by Secretary of War Stanton. The past came with a promise from Stanton, which delighted Douglas, of a formal commission to aid in the raising of black troops in Mississippi. So, having come to the White House full of grievances, Douglas departed smitten by Lincoln, writing that, quote, the wise, great, and eloquent president would, quote, go down to posterity if the nation is saved as honest Abraham. 
Even when the promised Mississippi Commission never actually materialized, the disappointed Douglas refused to blame the president. Having met the man, he was now persuaded that his anxieties about what he regarded as Lincoln's equivocations about slavery and freedom had been misplaced. At the same time, Lincoln had conceded nothing. A year later, Lincoln is back in deep political trouble. It is now 1864. There is an election coming up, and the Union war effort is going extremely poorly. There is mass disaffection in the North. It really looks as if Lincoln's going to lose the election to the Democrats. In fact, he scribbles out a note to the cabinet about what to do when he, do when he lost the election, and he put it aside. You know, to be opened in the, you know, in, on, on the event of my defeat in 1864. Everybody thought that was going to happen. Um, he invited Douglas to the White House again in the midst of all of this. Now, by this time, Douglas's enthusiasm that he'd worked up for, the, for Lincoln had waned again. He no longer was so hot on Lincoln. This is their second meeting. Earlier in the year, Lincoln was being pressed not just from disappointed Northerners who were angry about the fact that the war was going poorly. He was being pressed from the left by radical Republicans who were seeking a candidate who was publicly committed to racial equality. They tried to deny Lincoln the renomination under the Republican Party and replace him with John C. Fremont, who was a radical Republican at this point. Douglas, returning to his earlier criticisms of the president, backed Fremont for the presidency and for his radical uh, program for redistributing the rebels' lands to the freed slaves. Well, in the end, Lincoln handily fended off the radicals and won renomination in early July. The main threat now came from the Democrats, who, along with some moderate Republicans, are calling for a negotiated peace with the Confederacy. The 1864 election was against Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln and against, eventually, the Democratic candidate George McClellan, who was going to pursue peace with the Confederacy, who was going to end the war on the Confederates' terms, basically. The war was too much. Lincoln released a public letter stating that he could no longer consider restoring the Union unless the slaves were emancipated, which pleased some of the radicals but further riled the opposition. Lincoln next considered issuing a second letter in order to clarify his position, this is the politician again, and openly recognized that public opinion prevented him from ever fighting the war purely in order to achieve abolition. So he invites Douglas to the White House to talk about the situation. He wants his opinion. What should I do? Should he release the second letter or not? Douglas says, don't, don't, don't. Don't give way to those guys. And Lincoln laid the letter aside for good, which may have been Douglas's most direct contribution to the consequences of the war. Lincoln wanted more out of the meeting, though, because Douglas had been attacking him viciously. He told Douglas that the slaves were not flocking to Union lines as quickly as he had hoped, and he asked Douglas to undertake a new assignment devising some means to spread the word of emancipation to the slaves on the plantations. Douglas was stunned that Lincoln would approve of what looked to him like a slave uprising. It looked like John Brown all over again. And he eagerly agreed to come up with a proposal and quickly went to work on drafting specifics. Well, in fact, apart from its goal of liberating the slaves, Lincoln's proposal was the exact opposite of John Brown's crusade. John Brown, who was contemptuous of mainstream politics and politicians, aimed to overthrow slavery by first seizing the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry, a mission doomed from the start, a mission that Frederick Douglass himself told him was doomed from the start. Lincoln, the president of the very government that John Brown had attacked, was using his full force as commander-in-chief to impose emancipation on southern rebels, which was a mission with a reasonable chance of some success. Still, it made no difference to Lincoln that Douglas was deluding himself into thinking that he was reenacting Brown's revolution, just so long as the radical worked with him on emancipation and remained loyal to him in a dismal political season. And he did. General Sherman's victory in Atlanta several weeks later dramatically changed the political as well as the military situation, helping lift Lincoln to re-election while it rendered it unnecessary to take special measures to encourage the slaves to flee to Union lines. Once again, an administration to offer, offer to enlist Douglas came to nothing. But Douglas was greatly relieved, persuaded now more than even before that Lincoln was not just a personal friend, but a true friend to his people. Only weeks before, Douglas had ridiculed the president as an unprincipled politician who had to be forced by circumstances to do the right thing. Now he considered Lincoln's election imperative 
having seen in him, quote, a deeper moral conviction against slavery than I had ever seen before in anything spoken or written by him. Here is the real conversion story, the conversion of Frederick Douglass into a believer in Abraham Lincoln. It required no divine intervention, only Lincoln's sincerity and his political skill. And here I'll come to the conclusion. Less than seven months later, Douglass and Lincoln met for the last time. Approaching the White House reception following Lincoln's second inauguration, Douglass found his entrance barred by guards who claimed they had been told to admit no persons of color. But after Lincoln was alerted, Douglass gained admission. Quote, here comes my friend Douglass, exclaimed Lincoln, who took him by the hand and asked him what he thought of his speech earlier in the day, insisting, or so Douglass proudly recounted, that, quote, there is no man in the country whose opinion I value more than yours. Douglass replied that he thought it had been a sacred effort, and Lincoln said he was glad to hear it. Douglass then returned to his home in Rochester, New York, deeply honored, just as anyone, he later wrote, would regard himself honored by such expressions from such a man. Six weeks later, Lincoln was dead. To the grief-stricken Douglas, as to countless others, Lincoln had become something like America's Christ, whose martyrdom, he said, will be the salvation of our country by uniting blacks and whites in reconciliation. Well, that was not to be. The point is that after this, that Douglas in his later years, came to appreciate and understand exactly what had transpired between him and Abraham Lincoln. He arrived at a moral and historical appreciation of politics, as I've been describing it. The historian James Oakes has put it well. Douglas did not claim that the abolitionist perspective was invalid, only that it was partial and therefore inadequate. Lincoln was an elected official, a politician, not a reformer, he was responsible to a broad public that had no abolitionist crusader, that no abolitionist crusader, rather, had to worry about. Douglas, that is, had come to see politics as more complex than he had before the war. Is the kind of wisdom lost on political moralists of all generations, for whom revolution or radical reform is the ship, and virtually everything else is a corrupting bog of compromise. Without an appreciation of this complexity, it becomes easy to view Douglas as a backslider, as he later became, just as it was easy to see Lincoln as a hopelessly cautious politician who only began to transcend politics in 1862 or 1863. In fact, I argue, it was Douglas's pragmatic, I was sorry, it was Lincoln's pragmatic, at times cold-blooded, but always practical insistence on not transcending politics that enabled him, as Douglas put it in 1876, to restore the Union and, quote, free his country from the great crime of slavery. And I'll quote Douglas here. Had he put the abolition of slavery, Lincoln, had Lincoln put the abolition of slavery before the salvation of the Union, he would have inevitably driven from him a powerful class of the American people and rendered resistance to rebellion impossible. Viewed from the genuine abolition ground, Mr. Lincoln seemed tardy, cold, dull, and indifferent. But measuring him by the sentiment of his country, a sentiment he was bound as a statesman to consult, he was swift, zealous, radical, and determined. Had Lincoln as president been the radical that some would have preferred, the slaveholders almost surely would have won the Civil War. So with that, I will end with the two keys, egalitarianism, as understood by Frederick Douglass, but also by Abraham Lincoln as understood by Thomas Jefferson and also by Thomas Paine, and of politics. The politics expressed as, as, as practiced by two masters, Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln. Both achieved great things in American history, none greater than the abolition of slavery. Bringing moral justice to a, to a society that is by definition immoral and impure. The politicians need the egalitarians, but the egalitarians no less need the politicians. Thank you. Any <laughs> time for questions? Sir. In the uh, last debate. Oh dear, don't bring me there. <laughs> I have a screed about the last debate. It's going to appear on Saturday. <laughs> In, uh, in, in Newsweek, and I hope you will read it. Go ahead. All right. Um, 
Lincoln came up. Oh, that debate. Uh, oh! <laughs> yes, Lincoln came up. Go ahead. What is your reaction to that? Well, I, look, I mean, everybody knows where I stand in this election, so I'm not going to. No, you know. no, no, not the election. What about. What did Hillary say? About what Hillary said? Of, of Lincoln or the, the reaction to um, uh, Secretary Clinton's uh, quote, which I believe is accurate. Absolutely accurate. And, um, and the circumstances around it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, in fact, the reaction beautifully illustrates what I'm arguing against in my, in my book and in my talk, which is the idea that a politics, the politicians have to be perfectly consistent in public and in private. This is not a politics. It is impossible to conduct politics and have that kind of view. It's not as if you're lying to the American people, but if you're going to be involved in compromise, if you're going to be involved in hammering out differences, you cannot tell the public everything that it might want to know. You can't. That's politics. It strikes me as almost self-evident that that's the way politics should operate. And I think that's what the Secretary Clinton was trying to say with regard to Lincoln. That's what she had said to the people at Goldman Sachs, which is this is how politics operates in a real democratic society. That, to me, is not shocking. That, to me, is not a, a sign of hypocrisy. That's a sign of how a politician actually operates. Lyndon Johnson would not have gotten the Civil Rights Act of 1964 through if he had been perfectly consistent in his public and his private positions. Criticize Fred, uh, Franklin Roosevelt for being inconsistent? Or are you going to appreciate what he managed to get done with his inconsistency? Having hung around American politics as long as I have, that I'd rather go with someone who gets things done and someone gets things done effectively. So it's not about purism. Certainly, Jefferson was not about purism, but he was about equality. And that's, that's my response to it. You know, I, I find the, the criticisms kind of narrow-minded, um, and, and narrow-minded about American politics. Because American politics is not about truth and beauty. We're in an immoral world. Low that it could be about truth and beauty. I appreciate those who can push for truth and beauty, and they're necessary. You know? I'm that too sometimes. I really am. But that's not the end of it. Because if you're only relying on truth and beauty in a democratic society, you will not get anything done. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Very well. Sir? Uh, you talk about the importance of political parties. It appears there's a chance the Republican Party could blow the smithereens with this election, do you have any thoughts about what might happen over the next five years or so with that segment of the political yeah. spectrum? It's a, it's a fascinating question. I mean, I've, in recent days, come to the conclusion the Republican Party has already collapsed, um, but that we're staring at the rubble. Um, because it's hard to imagine the Republican Party, what's left of the establishment, or whatever you want to call it, if you, actually, now they're going to pander to the, to the, to the Trump people. Because the Trump people have made it very clear that they want to have nothing to do with the establishment of the Republican Party. They want what Donald Trump is giving them. And you're seeing that even more day by day. As people can, you know, as, as respectable Republicans <laughs> to finally to sever themselves from Trump over the most hideous performance, well, the Trump people say, no, you can't do that. And now they're backing off. Yeah. Now they're going back to Trump. Oh, well, we didn't mean it. They're caught between a rock and a hard place. They're caught between what they might want to believe and the reality of the Trump base. Donald Trump has nothing to do with the Republican Party except that he represents the base of the Republican Party. <laughs> that's an alarming truth for the Republican Party. So that's number one. Number two is, OK, let's suppose they don't want to pander to the Trumpites. Let's suppose they want to just distance themselves. Well, who are we talking about? We have everybody from Ted Cruz, Princeton whatever year, <laughs> to John Kasich, or to people to the more moderate than John. That's not a party. That's a fist fight. So where, is they, where are they going to cohere? Around the label Republican Party? Around an elephant? I, I, I just don't see it. I think the Republican Party is in, all right, maybe it hasn't collapsed quite yet, but I think it's in a state of collapse. And what is going to come of that is that something else will arise. I don't know what it's going to be. It could be a, a nationalist, 
um, um, reactionary party along the lines that Trump would like it to be, or the people behind Trump would like it to be, along the lines that say the Front National in, pa in France, that could be the Republican Party, in which case a lot of those other people would become something else. But I can say there won't be three parties because the political system in the United States really mitigates against three parties. So something's going to emerge, but I don't have enough imagination to, to think of what it might be. It's kind of a grand guignol imagination is required, in my view, politically. Uh, but it's going to be nasty and it's going to be harsh, and that I can guarantee as well. Sir? Yes, in his review of your book, Michael Bachelot essentially did a comparison Arthur Schlesinger and JFK. Yes. And Sean Ross and Hillary Clinton. Yes. Can you describe the role of the historian? Yes. Uh, in, in this yeah, that's a good, yeah. I mean, I was very flattered to be compared to Arthur, who's a friend of mine, and uh, I respected a great deal. So I wrote a little note to Michael thanking him. Um, but look, the world is very different, first of all, than it was in 1960. Uh, the political world is very different than it was. Um, in part, there was a rupture between the intellectuals and the politicians. We won't talk about the egalitarians and the politicians the, uh, in Vietnam, over Vietnam. And um, the intellectuals really were shut out of the White House, and the White House wanted to shut them out. And the intellectuals wanted to have nothing to do with the, with the White House, because, you know, look where it happened. And then you get Nixon, and then you get all the rest of it. There were some policy wonks, but policy wonks are different from historians. You know, we have nothing to offer in terms of policy particularly, except a few kibitzing remarks. And we're not experts in any of that. We preside something broader historically. And that has been, I must say, um, um, marginalized in our politics and marginalized in the political world. You know, what I'm doing hanging around even the corners of that still surprises me. Um, because there isn't much historical consciousness, really, in politics these days, as there, as there was in 1960. Um, um, when somebody like Arthur would be picked up by Jack Kennedy um, and, and appreciated for that. Now, at the same time, he wanted Jack, you know, frankly, he wanted Arthur around to write, you know, a, a favorable history of the Kennedy administration, I mean, which he ended up doing prematurely, sadly, mm -hmm. tragically. So, you know, let's not fool anybody. <laughs> Jack Kennedy was a politician, too. You know, it's not simply because he has high-minded ideas about American history. Although we once did review a book for the American Historical Review, which still surprises me. I can't imagine any subsequent president having the interest, let alone the ability to do that. Um, but I think it's a different world, you know. And the idea that any historian could have the influence in politics, or even a place in, in the White House that Arthur Schlesinger did, or Eric Goldman did under the Johnson administration thereafter, I think is fanciful. It's fanciful. It's just politics is constructed differently now. It's much bigger. I mean, you go to the West Wing now, and, and it's just a warrant of offices of people doing tiny, millions and millions of other things. And there's no, there's no coordinating intelligence in the way there was in the, uh, in, in, in the 1960s even. So, so I thank Michael for being so sweet, but uh, um, I don't think that there's a role for historians quite. We still have a role. We have a civic role. And I've tried in my own work to, 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 to do that as best I can. You know, and it um, occasionally involves you know, telling the House Judiciary Committee where to get off. Um, occasionally record just writing for the public. You know, there are those, those of us who want to do that. I mean, you know, I, I love this country and I want to work for the best of it, but I, I also know the limit of my role. And, I, you know. and it's also a matter of temperament because, you know, Arthur loved all that stuff. And I, I don't know. <laughs> Makes me a little nervous. And also, Washington is different. Let me conclude with that. I mean, Washington then, think about it. On uh, inauguration night, 1961, John F. Kennedy drives up late at night to Joe Alsop's house in Georgetown. And it's a glittering array of really smart people, very sophisticated people, ushering in the new frontier. Washington doesn't have it anymore. It just doesn't exist like that anymore. It's a cesspool, that place. <laughs> the, the journalism that comes out of Washington, you imagine you know, the old days, the Alsops, okay, Joe Alsop had his quirks, but Scotty Reston? Compare, I won't be invidious. But look at the editorial page of the New York Times today, with the exception of Paul Krugman. <laughs> and to what it was, Flora Lewis as opposed to Maureen Dowd? I mean, it's shocking, the, 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 the decline of, of, of that world. So 
So it's not as much fun. I mean, you know, when Arthur went to the White House, he wanted to have fun, and he had a lot of fun, and there was a lot of fun to be had. There's not any fun to be had anymore. It's not fun. You know, I don't mean fun in terms of the parties. Yeah, they're the parties. Not that great. But, um, but you're not having the zeal and the fun of doing something. The fun comes from beating back the other side and phew, having survived another day. You know, this is a good gig here at Princeton. I'd rather stay here and teach people how to do the kinds of things they can do better. I don't know if that answers your question, but... Well, it might have, but it's related to the Secretary General's question at the beginning, where uh, Secretary Clinton did refer to old man Hennepin, and then mm -hmm. just five minutes ago discussed uh, the Goldman Sachs speech, which talks about the public credit, whatever. Right. And then linking that into your book and your comments, there seems to be there some infiltration yeah, okay, I'll admit it. I'll admit it. There's a little infiltration. There is some. There is some. When I said historical consciousness, though, is, is not as strong, I meant it that way, meant it that strongly. Yes, there's a way in which I, I, Secretary Clinton was referring, in fact, in part, to things that some friends of mine and I have written. No question about that. But, but it's not as, it does not run as deep as it did. You know, it does not run as deep as it did. And in fact, all we were doing was giving her the words, historical words, to express what she already felt. You know, she, we weren't teaching her any history. She, she gets it, but she understands what Lincoln was about. But it's not the way it was in 1960. That's all I meant to say. Yeah, I didn't mean to be quite so coy. Yeah, there's some relationships, but you know, it's not what it was. And it certainly is enough to put an historian in the White House. <laughs> Sir. Could you apply your two categories, egalitarians and politicians, to Obama's record in the last eight years? That's an interesting question. Because, you know, the force of the egalitarians, except in very well organized, you know, special interest groups, has there is no there is no movement particularly. You know, there was a movement that came out in two thousand eleven after the with the Occupy movement, and that was pushing things. But it didn't have the kind of impact that it could have had because the right wing was it was even better organized. Mm -hmm. I think in terms of, of the um, I think of the um, early Obama administration. For all, it did extraordinary things, actually, when you think, think back on it. I mean, what did it get done? It got done the stimulus, which was, may have been inadequate, but it was something. It got done health care, which was an extraordinary thing that no one since Harry Truman and no Democrat had managed to do. That's an extraordinary thing, as long as he had a Democratic Congress. So it got watered down, but still, big deal. Or as the vice president put it, you know, an effing big deal. <laughs> However, I think that, that the president had made a, a, a bad mistake in assessing the political situation that he was up against vis-a-vis -vis the Republicans. Because even though he was in the majority, he still believed, I, and, and, he, and he acted upon it, as if the, the petty partisan differences that had come that had preceded him had to be undone, had to be over, overcome, that there was a possibility for some sort of partisan government. Mm -hmm. That reasoned men, and he would be the reasoned man of all, could somehow overcome these old divisions that dated back to the baby boomers. Now, he's sort of a baby boomer himself, but nevertheless, you know, Clinton, all of that, Gingrich, we're going to get rid of that, we're going to have a new era, you know, with an African-American president, frankly, who, this shows that we can do it. Yes, we can. No, we can't. And no, we can't because of the Republicans, frankly. The Republicans from day one said, we are not going to support anything you do. If you sneeze, we will not support it. And against that, the idea of post-partisanship, you know, I, I would have thought would have collapsed a lot earlier than it did. But he kept at it for a long time. Remember the grand bargains and all these attempts to try and bring the, the, the two sides together? There was no coming together. And I think, in fact, it ended up costing him the, 2000, uh, the 2010 midterms. And after that, his presidency was on a different course. So it wasn't so much the question of the politicians versus the egalitarians. I think there was a post-partisan or anti-partisan element, enough of an element in the early um, Obama administration that set things back, uh, along with the extraordinary historic achievements, which I don't in any way want to, want to slight. But the trajectory turned a different way in 2010, and things have been pretty bad since then, in my view. Yes, ma'am. Maybe building on the conversation you just had, um, you know, you mentioned the uh, wonderful uh, convergence that happened. There were many, many decades in between when you said the convergence happened between egalitarianism and politics. It seems like there's some political thought out there, if not, uh, I mean, egalitarian thought out there, if not egalitarian actors. There are certainly 
politicians, and I mean of the older stripe, not the, what you, what you mentioned, right. distinction. Um, but there certainly is a great deal of inequality, right? So inequality in almost any dimension that we could mention and maybe getting worse. What are your thoughts about the threads about where or how we might see something emerging, moving even toward convergence from here? Well, I mean, I think I think there are a lot actually. I mean, I, I mean, I think the Occupy movement, for example, did did achieve a great deal. Um, you know, for all of the people, you know, anarchists, blah blah, it got the issue of inequality on the front page of the New York Times for the first time since 1936 or whenever, or maybe in '64. That was an achievement. Maybe the court. Huh? Maybe the court. I don't know. Well, the court's going to be crucial, and I was going to get to the court at the end. Um, but there are these movements. The Sanders you know, um, enthusiasm, although I was, a, I was on the other camp, but nevertheless, it did a great deal to, to bring people into the system, to bring the issue of inequality right to the center. And then Senator Warren's been doing that as well. So I think that the issue has been discussed and have been, has been vented in ways that were inconceivable without those movements and without those figures. So I think it's on the table. It's on the table because of the, because of the Great Recession. And let's just, you know, people don't just do this. Boom, right? You know, collapse. And you see its emanations both in Trump and in generally in the populist stuff that's all over Europe, that's always ever. That has a lot to do with that. But you also see something else. Now, a lot of it depends on the outcome of the election, obviously, in, in November. But if the Supreme Court is in a different, different hands, right there, things are different. Possibilities are open. One forgets that we've had a very conservative Supreme Court for a very long time going back really to Nixon. And um, you know, the Burger Court was not conservative. The Rehnquist Court was very conservative. And now the court, you know, I call it the Scalia Court, even though, Rehnquist was the, uh, even though um, Roberts was the chief justice. That's an exaggeration. But that's no longer going to be the case in any, in, any, in any event. And if the Democrat wins, if Hillary Clinton wins, you may actually see the beginnings of the first liberal court in God knows how long, since the 60s. The, the fate of American government of political regimes, the court is at the absolute cornerstone of that. And again, because we don't elect the court, because we don't see the court in operation all the time, because we don't realize that, but it is. Think about where we've been over the last, since 1980, and think of how the Supreme Court has affected all of that. You know, going all the way from the decisions in the, night, you know, on, in, in the Rehnquist Court, some of the voting rights decisions very early on, but then, you know, I mean, Bush v. Gore. You know, the most extraordinary um, usurpation of power by any American, you know, political institution, certainly of, of the last century. Well, it's sort of a, between, you know, the next century we don't know yet, but certainly the last century. You know, that was extraordinary. You know, Citizens United, um, the um, the Holden case, Shelby County versus Holden. You know, gutting the the Voting Rights Act. That has been a progression. If that gets turned around, then the whole character of politics will be different. So, you know, it's not just movements. Movements are important. But the politicians will, will, will do their, their, their bit as well. This is a crossroads election. This is true long before Donald Trump announced his candidacy. If the Republicans win, won, no matter who it was, Republicans would have had control of every level of government, from the state houses all the way up to the federal government, all three branches. It would have been one party rule. If the Democrat won, the likelihood is that they were going to take the Senate, which they, looks like they may just do. Um, um, hmm. Um, and then the Supreme Court was going to be democratic, was going to be liberal, rather. That's, those are two, that's a crossroads. You're going in one direction or the other, no matter who the president is. You could have had the most moderate, you could have had Jeb Bush, the same thing would have happened. You know, Sanders, Clinton, it doesn't matter, the same thing would have happened. So we're living, you know, amidst all this craziness that we're, you know, dealing with today, with, you know, well, this is not an election now. This is a political emergency we're in. I firmly believe this is an abscessed election. This is not a real election anymore. It's not about party politics as normal, and people should respond as it is as it is a national crisis. I really believe that. So I think, Sean, um, if you want to leave people with maybe a more hopeful oh, uh, <laughs> maybe we could, I think maybe it's time to come to an end here and That's encourage them to maybe go take a look at your book. Two things, two things. First of all, it's all going to work out, okay? <laughs> it's all going to work out. That's not a promise, but it's a, what is it? It's a, it's a, it's, it, 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 it's not even a prayer. It's a statement. It's a statement. It's my deep historical view. 
It's all going to work out. There are two things you can do to help it work out. One is, of course, to buy my book. But the second is really, really work your rears off between now and November. I cannot impart to you how important this is. It's not about partisanship. It is a national crisis. So go to work, and we'll be all right. Thank you. Thank you very much.